Okay, last week when we talked about this, I told you three powerful points. God is sovereign. God works through the uh, laws that I outlined in his word. Point number three, I told you that Satan is the God of this world system. But then I told you that God defeated Satan, hell, and the grave, took away their authority, and gave that authority and ability back to the believer. So now that we have that authority, then now we need to know what is our authority. So how do we know that? We know that by knowing who we are in Christ, what we have in Christ, and how to fight. In other words, how to get the power and authority to manifest in your life. And so that's what we're going to be talking about from now to the end of the year. And so but before you begin to know that, you got to know what the authority you have in Christ. And so how do you know the authority you have in Christ is knowing how to study God's word. You got to know this. You got to know this. Uh, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible is in the book of uh, Joshua. He says, the book of the law should not depart out of the mouth, but meditate in the day and night. And when you do that, you will make your way prosperous. Not God. You will make your way prosperous. Because when meditating in the word of God, God will give you insight and guidance on how to open up doors and your way will be prosperous. Okay. So I share with you seven powerful truths. And I'm going to give you that again. These seven powerful truths is this. Number one, the Bible is not a natural book. It's a supernatural book and it is alive. Don't be defeated. Don't, don't, don't be deceived. These words in this book is alive. The Bible is alive. It's, a, it's the living Word of God. It's a supernatural book. It's amazing to me how people try to take a natural mind and decipher something that's supernatural. And so that's what causes a lot of arguments in the body of Christ because people are trying to decipher the Word of God with the natural mind. But the Bible is supernatural and it is alive. Point number two, I told you that the Bible is not a historical book, but it does prove history. There are historical events in the Bible, the historical events. And the Bible proves history. And I told you how uh, NASA uh, was trying to figure out how in the world they lost a day. They were able to calculate and see how old the world is. And when they did that, they noticed that the, they were off. And they said, we're missing a day. And they couldn't figure it out. But in the Bible, it shows you that because in the book of Joshua, he told the sun to stand still. And we actually lost a day that way. I told you in point number three that the Bible is not written in chronological order. That's another thing that throws people off. They think that Genesis is the first book of the Bible, Exodus. They think the book is like chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. That's how the Bible was written. No, the Bible is not in chronological order. It's not. Actually, the oldest book of the Bible is the book of Joshua. Job. And so Job should should probably have been first and then other books should have followed. But the Bible is not in chronological order. Point number four, I told you that uh, the Bible is written in two different um, ways. It, in the Old Testament, it's written in Hebrew and Aramaic. So a lot of times when you're trying to translate different things, you have to go to the original meaning to translate what was actually being said. So you have to look at Aramaic and Hebrew to understand some of the context of things in the Old Testament. And then the New Testament was written in Greek. So you need to make sure that you understand that. That's why I'm going to give you some things that you need in order to study the Bible. Point number five, I told you that... Um, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was point number five. Point number four was the original text of the Bible was written in long narrative form. It was written like one long letter, particularly when you get to the synoptic gospels. It was written like in one long narrative. So sometimes punctuation and different things, the translator throws things off. So that's why you have to study the Bible to make sure you understand the original context and what something was said. Point number six, I said that... Um, there are other books of the Bible. You know, there are other books. Uh, I taught at a Catholic school, and before I could teach in that school, they took me through a series of classes that I had to have. So one of the things that I learned is how the Bible was actually put together. And so what we have is the original canon of scriptures, the 66 books that the church used today. But there are other books out there, and I encourage you to read them. If you, you know, if you want to just be a scholar of scriptures, but a lot of the other texts basically just amplify what is already in the canon. But before I read the other books of the Bible, I would try to understand this first. I would try to understand this 
and then read and look at the other books as supplemental material to amplify this. Point number seven, I said that this is the living word of God. This is the authority in your life. You have to make this the final authority in your life. This is the living word of God. Don't be deceived. I know people try to come up with all kinds of ways and they try to be so intellectual and so they try to intellectualize things. Listen, I have a doctorate degree, okay? And I'm telling you that when it comes to the Bible, you got to throw away all that knowledge because the only way you can really understand what God's word is saying is through faith. It's a revelation. It's it's living. It's alive. And, it, and, it, and we're going to show you how to make that come alive in your life. Now, I closed out last week saying that there are four things you need. And this is what we're going to talk about from now on for the next couple of weeks. There are four things you need in order to study the Bible. There are four things you need. Number one, you need a teacher. Number two, you need tools. That's what we're going to talk about on Tuesday. I'm going to show you the different tools that I use. And now with technology, man, it is amazing. I mean, I was um, um, I was talking with a dear brother of mine, and we were going through the scriptures in his office, and I couldn't find a particular scripture, and it was just amazing how I was able to pull it up on my phone right quick. So there's really no excuse, but you need tools. I'm going to show you some of the uh, stationary tools I use to study the Bible. Number four, uh, number three, you need a technique. You need a technique. People just pick up the Bible and they say, well, I'm just going to read the whole Bible. And they start in Genesis and start reading. And Genesis is interesting. Exodus is interesting. But Leviticus, oh Lord. Numbers, oh my God. Deuteronomy, oh my God. When you get into the law, it's, it's tough. So I'm going to show you a technique on how to go through the Bible, a technique on how to do it. And then you have to set aside some time. You got to give God some time. You got to sit down, give him some time, as you're going through the word of God, okay? So the first thing you need to study the word of God, and you got to have it, is a teacher. You need a teacher. And God, gave us a teacher. Not necessarily a pastor, and you do need pastors, prophets, teachers, evangelists. I'm not talking about the ministry gifts, but what I'm talking about right now, God gave you, the believer, once you come into the kingdom of God and you confess Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, he gave you the best teacher, the best. He thought that much of you. He wanted you to have the best teacher that can decipher the scriptures. And the best teacher is the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. You have God the teacher on the inside of you. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I don't want to go into all of those different things, but I was talking to a Muslim friend of mine and I was explaining to her how it works how what we believe as Christians because she's like, so y'all have three different gods? I was like, no, we don't have three different gods. And I began to walk her through what we have, how it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but they are all, they're three different entities, but they are one. They function as one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit have three functions, but they are one. When it comes to the Christianity, how the, one of the best ways to kind of really wrap your mind around how it works is um, you look at an egg, an egg, right? The egg has the yolk and then it has the fluid that goes around the egg. And then you have the shell, three totally different functions, but one. You think about water, water could be a solid, it could be a liquid, it could be a gas. Three totally different functions on how that works, but it's still one. Okay, that was the little thing popped up. Still one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three different functions, but they are one in purpose. One in purpose. We're going to just, we're going to talk about that in November. Well, I'm going to uh, teach a series that, that's all a part of your authority. When I get into around November, I'm going to teach you the greatest gift 
ever given to you, and that's the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's the greatest gift ever given to mankind. But anyway, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, and he is the greatest teacher. Let's go to the Bible here. John chapter 14, verse 26. John chapter 14, verse 26. I used to use my trusty iPad, but you know, um, some scriptures I already have highlighted in my Bible, so I want to use my Bible today. So John chapter 14, verse 26. Listen to this. It says, but the helper, and we're going to talk about that in November. Stop trying to do stuff on your own. You have a helper that is sent to help you through difficult situations. Stop saying you don't know how you're going to come out of this. Stop saying I don't know how this is going to work out. Stop saying I don't know how I'm going to do this. I was talking to a friend of mine, he coached college football, and I was telling him, I said, I don't understand why a coach will go into a game, getting ready to call a game, and you are a Christian and you don't use the helper. The Bible says this. He says, but the helper, he's sent to help you. He said to help you. That's why it's been so difficult in your life. That's why it's been so challenging in your life. That's why you've been having so many difficulties and trying to figure out how you're going, because you're trying to do it on your own and you're not asking the helper to help you. He says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, listen at this, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. And guys, I'm telling you, I cannot tell you the amount of times I have used the Holy Spirit to teach me something. I'm telling you, I can't. I remember when I first started teaching, and you know, many of you, I, I, my, my training is different. I didn't go to the traditional route. Uh, to go into teaching. You know, most people, they go through college and then they do a student teaching. And after the student teaching, they go into the classroom and they actually start teaching. That was not me. Even when I became a professor, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, my, my wife, she was different. While she was working on her doctorate degree, she was able to actually do these labs and, and that amplified the professor's uh, lecture. And so she had experience. But when I stepped into the classroom as a professor for the first time, I didn't have any training and experience. I just kind of knew how to teach in high school and I was trying to teach adults the same way I was trying to taught high school students and it wasn't working. So I had to figure out a way. You know what I did? I asked the helper and this is what it says. He will teach you all things. The Holy Spirit taught me how to be a professor. He taught me how to be a high school teacher. And not only that, that list is not exhausted because it said he will teach you all things. So the Holy Spirit is there to teach you how to decipher the scriptures. He's there to teach you the written word of God. He's sent to teach you how to read the word of God. Stop trying to read the scriptures and say, I don't know what that is. Before you read the scriptures, you should always pray. And you should say, Lord, help me to understand what you're saying in the scriptures to me today. And Father, help me. Show me how this applies to my life. And then you read the scriptures. And then after you finish reading, you ask the Holy Spirit again to reveal to you what you've learned. And I got some, I got some more notes I'm going to uh, talk about. In but the Holy Spirit is said to help you. He said, the Holy Spirit who I send in my name will teach you all Things And not only that, he will bring all things to your remembrance that I have said to you through the word of God. So when you're in a, a difficult situation, when you're in a trying situation and you're about to go off on somebody, you're about to just let them have it, the Holy Spirit will quicken you. And he will bring, I know this, this goes out to all kinds of people, people and everybody say, what do you mean by quickening? In other words, he'll automatically just shake your memory and it'll come up. You'll be about to just say something off the off the cuff and the Holy Spirit will remind you, be slow to speak, but quick to listen. I have to take a, a bunny trail here. Uh, my wife and I, 
recently had lunch together. And um, when we were sitting down eating lunch, I was I had to I had to confess. I told her, I said, honey, I said, the Holy Spirit uh, told me uh, to listen to you, to listen to you. And uh, she's like, well, well, praise the Lord. Did you listen? I said, well, no, I didn't listen. <laughs> and because I did not listen, I had to pay a, a dire consequence in something. I made a mistake. And I'll never forget, just as clear as I'm talking to you right now through social media, the Holy Spirit said to me, it said to me, it said, listen to your wife. And then the situation was occurred. I allowed pride to come in. Yes, the bishop allowed pride to come in. I didn't listen to her. And I end up had to pay a consequence. So the Holy Spirit will bring things to your remembrance. It'll teach you things and it'll show you things. Go to John chapter 16, the very next chapter over. We were in John chapter 15. Just flip over, go over to the next chapter. John chapter 16, look at verse 13. John chapter 16, verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to show you something. Notice it's not saying it. The Bible here in this particular text, it's referring to the Holy Spirit as a he. It's showing you here that the Holy Spirit is a person that lives on the inside of you. It's not an it. It hit me. It knocked me down. It took control. It's not an it. It's a real person that lives supernaturally. Oh, I just am getting excited because I, I can't tell you the times that I've heard his voice. The voice, the voice. And the voice is so clear. And it'll say, do this, don't do that. Go here, don't go there. Turn left, don't turn right. Close your mouth. Don't say that. Swallow your pride. I can't tell you the amount of times that the Holy Spirit is talking. It is a real person that lives on the inside of you. So we're looking at verse 13 again. It says, however, I got to figure out a way so I can um, flash these scriptures up here. So for those that may be riding and, and they may be on their lunch and they may not have the Bible with them. So they're trying to... Um, Listen, and they're trying to go through the Bible at the same time. We'll, 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 we'll work on that. But it says, however, when he, the spirit of truth, talking about the Holy Spirit, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Go to 1 John 2.27. There's no way. There's no way, guys. I'm going to check this timer. I don't think my staff, I don't think uh, right now the only person here is Jonathan on my staff. There's no way you're setting this at 20 minutes. There's no way. Oh, my goodness. I don't think, I, 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 I think, I think he's, I think, I, I think he's shorting, I think he's shortening me some time. He got to be, man, 20 minutes. Wow. Wow. Okay. Okay. Wow. All right. Okay. But I, okay. Write this scripture down. Yeah, I got, I got, I got some of the scriptures. Okay. Okay. R write this scripture down. First John chapter two, verse 27. This is like my granddad, my granddad used to call this I John. First John, I used to call it I John. First John two, verse 27. We'll close out with this one. And there's no way, man. I've been on here 20 minutes. Okay. 1 John, I John, verse 2, verse 27. Okay. 1 John 2, verse 27. But the anointing, 
which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you. Now, I wanted to read that from the New Living Translation, but for the, for the sake of time, what the text is not saying, it's not saying that you don't need a teacher, okay? But what the text is originally saying in its original context, what the text is originally saying is this. You shouldn't take everything that Reverend said. Anyway, I know, I know I have people that follow me and I minister to the word of God and you, and you, you oh man, you just think I'm, I'm an amazing teacher. But you need to go back after I've said something and you need to go back and look and let the Holy Spirit teach you as well. But it says this, uh, he abides in you and you do not need to teach because he's talking about the Holy Spirit abides in you. So you don't need a person just to tell you everything because the Holy Spirit abides in you. But the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie and is just as taught you you will abide in him. So in other words, it's saying that the Holy Spirit abides in you and you abide in him. And in other words, when you hear something, you shouldn't take anything as face the final authority because the Holy Spirit, now, now there is a function that I have. There is a function that a pastor have, teachers, prophets, evangelists. They're, they're, they're there to guide you and to show you and to cultivate you. But we're not God. We're not God. We're not God. And so you have to go back. And in your, that's why you need your own private time to go back and look at what the word is saying and say, whoa, wait, wait, wait a minute. But, and and that's, that you, that's what you have to understand, that your, your pastor, your teacher, your, your, your prophet of God, he is not God. He's just sitting there to guide you. And you have to go to the word of God for yourself. You have to go to the word of God for yourself. Because if you don't go to the word of God for yourself and you start taking everything that somebody says to you, that's not Christianity. That's a cult. When you start repeating what Reverend said more than what God said, that's a cult. That's a cult.